Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a, a new week uh, as we begin our sessions. Uh, so before we start today's class, uh, let's just remind ourselves what we covered last week. Last week, we looked at why we are learning uh, revivals, visitations, and moves of God. We looked at a few points. We looked at, uh, firstly, we want to become more like Jesus. Two, to be more Christ-like, uh, not only in our personal life, but also collectively um, as a church community. Then we also looked at, uh, when we study revivals, we ourselves will be revived in our spirit. Then we saw seasons of revival that God takes us through. Now, today we will start with what happens in a revival or an outpouring or a move of God. Right? Uh, when we look through the book of Acts and then we, when we also look at church history, the different revivals, the different moves of God that happened, something very unique happened. That is, God was working above the normal, which means it was not a normal thing. Right, things were happening. Supernatural things were happening, right? Uh, which not only impacted the believers, but it also impacted people who were, uh, you know, uh, in the society beyond uh, those who are uh, unsaved. So it started just rippling. It was a ripple effect, just touching many people. So in the Book of Acts and through revivals in church history, we we can recognize uh, you know seasons of outpouring so now let's just look at a few points uh, and try to understand what happens in a rev revival so we last week we looked at uh, you know why we are studying this revivals and a move of god uh, a visitation of god now let's look at what happens when there's a revival or a move of god i'm on page 4 if you're tracking along with your notes First point, there is, you know, a great revelation of who God is, right? Uh, especially when there is a move of God, the Holy Spirit comes in power. We are filled with awe and wonder, right? Like, we're, we're, oh, he's a holy God. His love is so great. His power is so great. So there is this new and a greater revelation of who God is, right? Uh, uh, if we read in the book of Isaiah, the first few chapters of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah is writing, you know, uh, you all have, he's writing to the Israelites, he's saying uh, to the Jews, he's saying, you know, you people have gone away from God, you, you are sinful in nature. And all of a sudden in Isaiah 6, Isaiah himself has this great revelation of God. And what does he say after that? He says, Woe is me, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. So it was a great revelation. Before that, he was just telling people, you know, you all are sinners. But that there was a revelation of who God is. And so uh, during uh, an outpouring or, or a revival of God's move, uh, we are suddenly... You know, God makes us aware of our weaknesses, of our sins, of our frailty, of of the you know of the things that we you know so much desire, which are of no use at all. Uh, so, first point: there is a great revelation of who God is. Second point: there is a heightened revelation of spiritual truths and realities. Right. Uh, so maybe we've heard hundreds of, uh, you know, sermons before, but what we have heard and what we have read will come alive uh, into our spirit, into our hearts when there is a, a, a revelation, when there is an outpouring of uh, of God's Holy Spirit among us. Right. Uh, it's like this, you know, we'd be uh, maybe we are reading the scriptures and uh, uh the words will just jump off the Bible, meaning it, it just brings revelation, word after word, scripture after scripture. And there will be this passionate in, increase uh, for, you know, this hunger to know more of God. I'm reminded of uh, 
we will study about this also later. Uh, William Booth, uh, in the early 1700s, William Booth, uh, he, he started the Salvation Army. Now, how he went about studying this is really interesting because uh, one day he was just reading his Bible and John 3.16, which you and I, all of us know this was John 3.16. Uh, so he was just reading in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. So as he read that, there was, the scripture was just, you know, brought alive into him. And he thought, okay, you know, I have to do something about this. God loved the world that he gave his son. And there are so many people who don't believe. So we have to make sure that everyone get to believe. And then he went on, uh, uh, you know, to start the Salvation Army. And there was a great outpouring, a great uh, work of God uh, through the Salvation Army. So when there is an outpouring or a move of God in our midst, there's a heightened revelation uh, of spiritual truths. Third point, uh, an increased passion and fervor and zeal towards spiritual things, right? So, uh, of course, all of us have, uh, you know, a passion, a zeal. Uh, but what happens when there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that there will be an increased passion, increased zeal. So maybe we are reading the Bible every day for half an hour, 30 minutes. And, uh, you know, when there is a move of God, you, you know, we're not going to stop. We say, hey, I want to read some more. It'll go on for an hour. It can go on for one and a half hours, two hours. Why? Because uh, there's this passion, this zeal that the Holy Spirit puts in uh, each of us, right? Uh, and it could be even prayer, discipleship, fellowship, all these things, right? Uh, witnessing missions. Uh, there'll be an increased zeal and passion uh, for God. And uh, uh, we'll learn about the Welsh revival later, but uh, here's something interesting about the Welsh revival. You know, uh, it's really interesting. The When the Welsh revival, the outpouring began, uh, uh, it was winter season. And, uh, you know, people used to throng to the churches, right? And uh, so... Uh, and during the Welsh Revival, what they did was they had 6 a.m. services. So people could attend the 6 a.m. service, finish up by about 8, 8, 8 a.m. And then people can go back to their work, work the whole day. Uh, so in the Welsh Revival, uh, and we know that, you know, in uh, England, mostly it's raining. So they would come at 5 a.m., hold umbrellas, and stand outside the church in a queue so that they get a place to sit in and you know 5 a.m and then uh, the church services begin at 6 a.m they would finish by about 7 38 then they would go on to carry on their own work now this normally would not happen every time right uh, uh, but what happened it there was an outpouring there were, a passion, a zeal. Everyone wants to go to church. Everyone wants to uh, hear the word of God, learn the word of God. So this is something that happens. Uh, fourth point, an increased gathering of the unsaved. So we see this in the book of Acts. You know, uh, Jesus uh, has uh, died, he's resurrected, he's gone, he's given the commission to his disciples. Now, Peter preaches his first sermon, uh, and 3,000 people are saved, right? And increased, you know, gathering into the church. Then uh, the lame uh, person was healed. Again, another 4,000 added. So in no time, there were about 7,000 people pledging allegiance to Jesus, and the church was growing uh, in, in, in an increased manner. Uh, so even when we look at a move of God, when we look at a, a revival and outpouring of God's spirit, one thing is like a magnet, uh, the glory of God will come upon communities, upon people, right? People who may not have believed Jesus for, you know, their entire life in a, in a minute, in a second, they say, yes, I believe this. I accept this and begin to walk in this uh, new uh, calling that God has for them. So, so it's interesting to see that uh, 
mostly, mostly, uh, you know, where there's revivals, outpourings, uh, there has been a, an influx of people being saved and brought into God's kingdom. Fifth point, an increase in supernatural manifestations, unusual miracles. Uh, now, this is common. This is a common aspect that we will see. Uh, remember this, where the Holy Spirit is, right? And where there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there will be supernatural signs, wonders, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, right? It goes together. There's an increase of the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. Then there's an increase in miracles and, uh, you know, manifestations and supernatural work, right? Uh, and this happened in in the book of Acts uh, when we see that, you know, uh, you know, Peter, Peter's shadow was healing people. So if you picture this, it was a supernatural work of God. It happened just one time. It didn't happen all the time. But but because of this, people began to hear, hey, Peter's coming. So they would bring all their sick, they line them up, and Peter would walk, and the shadow would bring healing. So it was an unusual manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Another example is during, during the early 1950s, uh, there was a preacher, an evangelist, a healing minister named Brother A.A. A. Allen. Uh, now, there are a few videos of him on YouTube. Uh, you may be able to find it. Brother A.A. A. Allen. And God called him towards the healing ministry. And uh, God used him very powerfully. And, you know, he would, uh, he would just, you know, he would just bring people up on stage. And, and, and you know, they are like lame people who are uh, lepers, uh, you know, uh, with all kinds of infirmity. And he, he would just say, in the name of Jesus, I command you, rise up and walk. I command this infirmity to be uh, bound, to be loosed from his body. It was just a simple prayer. Uh, but there were supernatural works, right? Um, now, so I want to encourage you, get time, read about Brother A.A. A. Allen. It was, a, it was a great move of the Holy Spirit uh, during that time. Sixth one, we see uh, when there is uh, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there's a powerful transformation of society. So it's not only that you know, the church or the body of Christ is impacted and it, you know, the body of Christ grows, which is good. But the, the, the outpouring of the spirit affects the people around, affects the society. Uh, social evils begin to diminish and righteousness and truth will prevail in the land. Right. Uh, if we read the smitten outpouring, uh, we may look at it uh, uh, briefly, but in the smitten outpouring, uh, it's funny, and it's happened in many uh, revivals too, where uh, the revival has become so powerful that the entire society, 95 to almost 98% of them are believers. And what's happening? There's no crime in the city or, or in the state. There's no crime. And so... Uh, you know, uh, this couple of books where it mentions that, you know, the the police, the cops don't have any work to do because there's no crime. And so the police were asked, okay, to fill in duty time, you go and sit and be part of the church services. And it's a fact. It's true. Why? Because there was this, the Holy Spirit, the move of God just went out into society. People were convicted of their sins. And there was no, uh, you know, uh, uh, crime happening in the society and so it's true uh, that a move of god affects the society as well uh, the seventh point uh, when when there is a move of god uh, there is an increase in equipping in you know sending out ministers and starting of new missions new churches all of this planting of uh, you know mission fields uh, new mis ministries, all of this will take place. Now, it's not that, you know, it's important to understand this. When we are part of an outpouring or a release of, of the Holy Spirit, 
it is important to understand that, okay, we are not to be comfortable in where we are. Okay, God, we thank you for this revival. Uh, help us to grow. Yes, that's good. But remember the commission, the commission that Jesus gave us was to go and make disciples. So usually in a revival, there is an increased, um, you know, uh, uh, a move where there's new ministries starting. There are new churches. There are new believers who are transformed into leaders. And so it's not only a, a habitation, but it's also a spread of uh, God's fire. So these are a few points on what happens in a revival. Right, so what we'll go to is we'll go to chapter two uh, and we'll look at the book of Acts. Right now, I know most of us have been uh, reading the book of Acts and it's a, it's a lovely book to read and we can enjoy reading that. Uh, so let's look at the second chapter, journey through the book of Acts, meaning what happened? Right. We, we can safely say that, you know, there was a revival, there was an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. But what happened in the book of Acts? Right. Most of us know, uh, you know, uh, Acts chapter two, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But what happened after that? Right. And what are the things that we can learn from the book of Acts? Right. Uh, if I'm going too fast, please let me know uh, and I will slow down to you can just let me know. Okay, uh, everyone with me, right? Yes, Pastor. Okay, okay. So let's look at the book of Acts, chapter two. Now, the book of Acts records about forty years of God's move of the Holy Spirit, right? Now, when we look at uh, Acts chapter two, God's Spirit moved in Jerusalem. And, uh, and then on the day of Pentecost, what happened? The outpouring, then the habitation, the fire spread from Jerusalem into Asia Minor, into Europe and different parts of the world. And finally, even to Rome. So an interesting point is that fire in the book of Acts it did not die out. Right? It was not like a like a temporary thing. OK, 3000 people and then they were struggling. No. The, the, the church just began to enlarge. 3,000 became 7,000. Uh, I'm sure uh, it would have grown larger. Then the church spread into Antioch, get, went into Asia Minor, into Europe. So the move of the Holy Spirit was evident in the book of Acts. And you will learn more uh, uh, even in the New Testament survey and other subjects. You will learn in detail from the book of Acts, but let's look uh, at what the Holy Spirit can do uh, through people and communities as he empowers us um, to be part or to, uh, uh, to be involved in a revival and a move of God. Some important points, just three important points here. One accord in prayer. Right. Uh, we see that in the book of Acts, uh, it opens with this 120 disciples are fervently praying uh, in the upper room, uh, spent 10 days in prayer. But what were they doing? They were praying in one accord, right? One accord in prayer. So there was, I'm sure we've all heard this, right? One accord to be in one mind. So it was not like one person was saying, okay, let's pray for this, you know, the city of Jerusalem, or let's pray for my family, let's pray for the sick people. No, they were in one accord. What was that one thing that they wanted? They wanted the move of God in that city, in their lives, right? Two important things that we can learn from this. One accord is being one heart, one mind. Now, a lot of people, you know, young people, especially uh, in, in our church here, they ask me, oh, God did such wonders before. Is he able to do it now? Yes, he's able to do it now. But why is it that we don't see 
you know, an outpouring or a powerful revival like in church history. I think the main reason is because there is no oneness, right? Uh, I believe that, you know, uh, it, it's a sad thing, uh, not everywhere, but it's true because everyone are so involved in their own ministries, which is good, uh, but there should be this one accord in the body of Christ, right? To, in prayer, uh, there should not be any personal agenda. Uh, and when, when we let go of all these, we will see a move of God, a powerful move of God, right? The second thing that we see here is there was continuous collective prayer, right? Uh, now, as a pastor of a church, I know this, and I've, uh, uh, the things that we notice, if we have a worship evening, you'll have a good number of people coming for the worship evening. But if we have five days of fasting and prayer, you'll have about three or four people turning up. Why is it? Have, have you ever wondered, uh, you know, why? Because prayer is not very interesting, you know? But here's the thing, if we are to see a move of God, if we have to see the power of God move, we have to be people of prayer. The 10 who were in the uh, spending 10 days, they were in continual prayer, right? continuous prayer in one accord. So we have to be able or willing to take up this, right? Uh, so I told my, uh, you know, our church people, this is why, this is why we are, you know, not seeing a revival because, because we we have it's we can't blame it on God. God, why you're not doing it? It is our responsibility, right, to pray and to uh, be in one heart and one mind. Two, we see that there was an outpouring of the Spirit. Now, the outpouring was not uh, for entertainment purposes. Right? The outpouring was to empower the disciples. Right? If you remember, uh, you know, the disciples, none of them were there when Jesus was dying. All of them are gone, uh, running away. Maybe they were afraid or that they would get caught next. Uh, Peter, none of them were there. Peter, James, John. John was there, but uh, the others, no, none of them were there. Uh, but after the outpouring, we see the same disciples who are fearful were ready to even die for the sake of Jesus, right? Why? Because the Holy Spirit empowered them, right? And this empowerment was accompanied by supernatural phenomena, right? Supernatural phenomena. So uh, if we look at uh, the book of Acts, what happened in Jerusalem, it was, it was something extraordinary. What happened that, uh, that Jerusalem usually has about 100,000 people, residents who live there. But it was, uh, uh, it was the time of the feast, right? So you have the Passover, then you have the feast of the first fruits, and on the 50th day you have Pentecost, right? So that small city, Jerusalem, which usually has about 100,000 people, that week or that whole, almost that whole, uh, I would say maybe 50 days, there were about 500,000 people gathered there, people from different parts of the city, right? Different parts of uh, different places. They've all come to Jerusalem. Why? Because it's the festival time, right? Um, so you have the Passover, which commemorates, you know, what God did uh, by uh, through Moses and the blood of the lamb was put on the, uh, the doorposts. Uh, so there's a grand celebration of the Passover. Then is uh, the the feast of the first fruits, which is uh, the people come and they say they bring their offerings, their first fruits, and they say, God, this is the first fruits that we have received. And so again, there's a celebration. And from the first fruits on the fiftieth day is the Thanksgiving. It's called the Pentecost. It's to say thank you for the fruits of our labor. And so on this 50th day, people witnessed the move of the Holy Spirit, right? Now we got, if we read the book of Acts, we see there were three different kinds of responses 
from the people, right? Some were confused, saying, "Hey, what what is happening here? They're just speaking something random, um, and uh, they're just screaming. And what's happening? Maybe they're drunk." Some were amazed and marvelled. Oh, there's, there's there's something happening here. Uh, I say, "Wow." You know, and and then we see that they they were Peter preached the gospel. They were amazed, and they accepted that gospel, but the others also mocked at what happened. Now, remember, maybe God can use you and me uh, uh, in a revival, in an outpouring of God. Not everyone will accept what is happening. Right? People may mock you. People may make fun of you people may say this is something that doesn't make sense remember that that if it's a genuine move of god there will be lives touched and people will mock people will make fun uh, people may not understand but we continue in what the holy spirit is leading us to now a very important point to understand as we study this is in Acts chapter 2, Joel prophesies, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Peter is saying, in Joel chapter 2, right, uh, it says that my people, they shall, you know, have visions, they shall have dreams, they will prophesy and all of this. Now, the Holy Spirit is telling Peter, this is that. Right? Uh, he's taking uh, the situation of the outpouring and he's saying, this is what Joel wrote about. Now picture this. If you, if you see, there was no visions, nobody had dreams, and nobody was prophesying in the book of Acts. Right? But how did Jesus, how did Peter say, you know, this is that? Uh, an important lesson to learn. Now, uh, the supernatural manifestation of God does not have to be identical to what happened before, right? Now we may, after this, we go on to read about uh, a few examples in church history, how God moved. Now, just because the move of God is not like that, doesn't mean it's not the Holy Spirit working. Right? The Holy Spirit can work in his own way and uh, when he does so, he may do it in different ways. He may do it in a similar way as well. Uh, but we are to be open to it. Right? I remember last week, uh, uh, Sister Rupa was mentioning that uh, you know they started the worship thing. Right? It may not be something that is identical to the uh, what happened in the church history or where there was a move of God, yet it is a move of God. It is an outpouring of God. There can be a revival through it, right? So we don't judge what the Holy Spirit is doing or how he's doing it, right? So these are a few points. Uh, any questions? If not, I, uh, we can just continue. Okay. I have a question, Pastor. Go ahead, Charles. I am, I am talking about the oneness because as you, as you shared the, that people are asking you that the God who did the miracles and the moves in the early church, is he able to do it today? And you answer them that it's because of the lack of oneness. But the, the, the works are so diverse. The offices have been I can say they have been separated. In the early church, the offices of prophet, teacher, so and so, all the offices were working together as one. But now they have been separated. You will find apostle so and so is having a church, prophet so and so is having a church. Instead of all those offices working together in one particular church, they are pulled. Now, what can we do? Uh, is it a matter of prayer or we need to engage in teachings so that these people come back and work together? Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, that's a good question, Charles. So, yes, firstly, we should 
be established in the fact that what God did before, it's the same Holy Spirit that's working now. So yes, he can do the same wonders, miracles. Yes, it can happen. But you, know, uh, you were saying that, you know, there are different ministries and now it's all, you know, uh, people are starting, you know, uh, focusing on their own ministry. So I would say this, uh, in the book of Corinthians, Paul writes and he says, we are many bodies, many parts of one body, uh, but we work together so that the body functions well. He writes, he just goes on to explain, you know, uh, the hand and the legs uh, have to work together in coordination. So I believe also in another place uh, in the book of Acts, he says, uh, the believers, you know, spend time in prayer and teaching of the word of God. So Charles, to answer your question, two things are important. One is we need to teach the word of God Right? We need to uh, make people understand that we are not building our own, uh, you know, our own kingdoms, but we are all part of God's kingdom. And two, I think we need to come to a place of humility where we say, you know, whether you're a prophet, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a teacher, we are all one. And so for that humility to come in, uh, we have to pray. Right? Because it's easy to be humble when we are small, the ministry is small, but as the ministry is growing, you have thousands of thousands of people, um, you know, uh, say, okay, I am prophet this, I'm prophet that. Uh, so what happens is uh, it, there comes division, right? Um, and so I believe, Charles, to answer that, you know, it's a good question. So one is prayer and teaching of the word of God, which is very essential. And two, to walk in humility. Uh, you know, we can teach the word of God and pray and all of it, but if we are not walking in humility, again, there's going to be division. There's going to be this whole thing of, you know, I am better or this ministry is better and that ministry is better. Uh, but so this is important. Prayer and teaching of the word of God and two, uh, to walk in humility. I hope that answers your question, Charles. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Okay, so let's... Okay, Christopher has raised his hand. Go ahead, Christopher. Yes, Pastor. So I wanted to understand uh, what, what are some of those, some of those motivator, uh, motivation uh, you know, characteristics that um, make uh, people... Uh, or sorry, men of God to, you know, to start churches in the first place. There's so many of them already. And um, what makes them, uh, you know, want to um, continue with that, you know, with that approach? Uh, so I just wanted to understand from, you know, from, as a pastor, what is your view on that? You know, what are some of the motivation? Motivation. I think you've already mentioned about, you know, humility. When you said humility, I mean, I think one of the motivations would be pride. Yeah. Uh, you know, pride of, you know, starting a church. Yeah. Uh, but what are some of the other ones, if you could please uh, yes. provide more detail? Yeah, uh, nice question. Thank you, Christopher. So um, I would say there are a couple of reasons. Now, first reason is, you know, uh, God has told you, uh, you, you know, as a young boy or uh, as a young person, God has, you know, uh, revealed it to you that, uh, this is something uh, you have to start a church, and it's happened. There are few people. There are people that I know that, uh, you know, uh, for example, Pastor Ashish. He he knew that God had called him to start a church, so he knew, right? Uh, and then there are other reasons why people like to start, right? Uh, one is they like to preach, right? They just like to preach the word, right? Uh, it may not be a calling of being a pastor, but they like to preach the word genuine uh, reason another reason could be that they like to be on the spotlight like they, they like to be on the stage right uh that's the second reason uh, another reason uh, uh, another reason could be that people uh you know this is uh, funny because this i spoke to a young man and uh, 
a couple of years back and a uh, young man maybe uh, he was about 25 years old and he was saying oh, pastor you pray for me because i want to start the church and i said oh, but you're serving in this church right you're serving here uh, and and you're doing well here uh, has God told you to start a church? He said, uh, yes, God has told me. And God has told me that, you know, I will start the church, uh, a new church, and the church will be better than this church. And the moment he said that, uh, I was taken aback, but I told him, see, uh, you know, I remember speaking to this young man and I told him, see, it's not about, you know, being better than someone, right? It's not, yes, you are young and God has called you, but it's not about, you know, your church being better than this church. Uh, so it's about the calling of God, right? There are plenty of, uh, again, Christopher, there are plenty of people that I've spoken to where uh, they are pastors. And two years after starting a church, they've shut down the church. Uh, why? Because they could not handle the pressures or the church was not growing. Now, I wouldn't say that they were not called. Uh, but there could be reasons where they were they, they did not pursue God. Now, church growth is not easy. It takes time, it takes effort. So, uh, so there are plenty of reasons why people start churches. So there was another funny reason, a young man, right? It's interesting to know this, but uh, it's true. Right? We get to speak to some people. And I asked him, oh, why, why do you want to start a church? I always ask people, why do you want to do this? So I said, why do you want to start a church? So he said, no, because I like to, uh, Monday to Friday, I don't have to do anything. I just have to pray for people. I can pray for them over the phone. And I just go visit them a few times. Uh, that was his answer to me. He was just being truthful. He didn't want to work Monday to Friday. Right? Uh, uh, another person said, uh, this is really funny. Another person said, because... I would like to wear, uh, you know, a suit and a blazer, and be. You know, I don't get a chance to wear that, so I can wear these on, wear it on Sunday. So that was the answer, right? And and you know, I was taken aback. But these are some of the reasons why people start churches. But there are the genuine work of God where people, you know, you know, they God has called them. There's a vision. There's a call. There's a upon their life and. Uh, you know, uh, God begins to really work in their lives. So, uh, so yes, Christopher, there are these are some of the reasons, right, uh, uh, that I could think of. Yeah. Okay. Samuel, go ahead, Samuel. Um, so while I don't know, Pastor, if we are getting off topic or you know if there is something in continuation this topic, like so we're we're discussing about. Um, starting church uh, and and the reasons the right reasons and the wrong reasons for yeah. starting churches you know so i'm i'm wondering like let's say yeah uh, you know because you have some experience in the field so um, apart from god's calling so i think uh, the number one reason is god calls you to plant a church uh, or or puts in your heart that uh, you know i will start a church uh, from you so that that is one but let's say i had to check myself uh, I have to check and see like there are already churches like now I think anywhere we go it's yeah. not that that place does not have a church but I'm thinking what should be a, what should be some of the few things that uh, I need to be mindful of uh, that uh, that sort of validate as starting church for the right reason and it's not that I'm, I want to start a new doctrine like like let's say I'm part of a charismatic church but yeah. I somehow don't uh, link to that so so i, I i'm i'm thinking i'm thinking of all the divisions that are there so this is i think one primary division is charismatic versus non charismatic church and let's say how does a person from a charismatic church then start a non charismatic church is, is that a sufficient reason like having a different doctrine um or um and i, I think i'm just thinking along what should yeah. be the right reasons for starting yeah. a church thank you okay yeah that's that's a good question so uh, samuel if even if you look at church history uh, here's a uh, you know interesting thing. You know, the, there's a powerful move of God. People are getting healed. Wonderful ministry. Uh, churches are growing, and all of this. But uh, as I mentioned, there was a lot of you know conflict uh, between uh, church leaders, right? Uh, and uh, the main reason why a lot of revivals just you know we will look later on on uh, you know there were some revivals that just bursted out. 
and it just died like in a few days. Uh, and the reason was there was conflict between the two leaders or maybe the three people who have started the ministry, right? Uh, uh, and so uh, when when we when you say that you know uh, the the right reasons, for example, you said the charismatic to starting a now doctrine could be one of the reasons, right? It could be one of the reasons. So, for example. Uh, uh, let me give you an example. I know of a person who said, uh, I don't believe in speaking in tongues, but I believe that that stopped in the book of Acts, but he believes in everything else, right? Uh, he was part of our church for some time and uh, uh, he believed in everything else, right? He believed in the healings, miracles, everything, uh, you know, the word of God, but he didn't believe that the gifts are still functioning, right? Uh, and so he believed that, and he's a very powerful man of God. Right? He was a young man. Uh, he would preach really well. Um, he led the worship also really well. Genuine uh, good work that God is doing through his life. But there was this whole issue. So I did try to explain to him. I told him, see, this is what it is. Uh, the Holy Spirit is still at work in us. He comes with the gifts of the, uh, the Spirit and uh, we can move with the Holy Spirit. But somehow it did not go through to him. And he did speak to other ministers of God as well, but it didn't work out. So it was a complete doctrinal issue. And then he he said, I think I have to go and I, I, I want to start my own church, right? Uh, and so he did that, right? We are still in talking terms, like we are not set or anything. Uh, we still talk to each other. We're still uh, good friends. And uh, uh, But he started his own church. Why? Because it was a doctrinal issue. So as I mentioned, Samuel, there, 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 there are many reasons. Doctrinal issue is one of the reasons as well, right? Now, whether it is a genuine thing, uh, now we cannot say that okay because you don't believe this you are wrong right it could be that god will you know speak to them minister to them mm -hmm. and uh, there may be a change of heart god can bring revelation uh, you know what's interesting we see now is there are new kinds of teachings or oh, as you were saying there's so many churches so many ministries uh, some of uh, i was really uh, uh, i was in a shock when i uh, read when not read when i saw a video of a prominent uh, bible teacher and we uh, leave the name unnamed uh, uh but a prominent very very prominent bible teacher and he he went on to say that you know um there's not going to be a rapture uh, right and he's got his own bible college he's got his own wonderful ministry wonderful teacher man of god uh, but he said that uh, there's not going to be a rapture and so uh so yes, doctrinal issues will be there. And there will be times when people will separate from mm. us for, because of doctrinal issues as well. So uh, uh, our part is to you know, stick to the word, teach them the word, and uh, that's the most that we can do. So. This, um, as a follow-up, um, what I'm thinking is, um, you know, in, in, in the 1700s, 1800s, or you know, yeah. just a couple of decades back, like, we look at missionaries, we look at most people who started revivals. Yeah. Uh, these happened in places where there were no churches, you know, uh, or there were right. churches, but like for namesake, uh, traditional. So these people went in there, a lot of conversion happened, uh, church planting happened because people, the local people didn't have access uh, access to the word of God. Not all of them were educated. Not of, all of them could read. So like like William Carey himself, he came to India. Correct. No church. So he started, uh, he printed Bibles. Uh, so, so uh, And that's a powerful, uh, and powerful revival. And and uh, it's it's something new. It's it's like uh, you know how mobile phones are introduced, and everyone's now uh, ha has to have a smartphone. Uh, but I'm thinking so now. So, so, so I, I'm looking at two big issues. So one is uh, revivals, uh, starting revivals, uh, calling uh, or or uh, you know praying for revivals, and and uh, being ready. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 like, I want to start a revival. I want to be a part of a revival. Like, I want God to use me as a revival. So that's one. Uh, but then the other one is, uh, at the same time, there's this, oh, the whole issue of 
uh, so many churches, and probably some of the churches wanted to start a revival. They said, you know, uh, our churches have become the churches who are, uh, that has been there for, you know, I, I don't know, for a good 50, 60 years, UC and IC, and like whatever churches. So these churches have become too traditional now, and mm-hmm. it's become more like, so let's, let me start a new and start a revival. But then that is, again, causing more divisions. So it's yeah. kind of like a juxtaposition where, uh, you know, in, in, uh, for the, with the intent of revival, I um, ended up creating more um, yeah. divisions. So, so uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Samuel. So uh, uh, I, w- I would like to just, just uh, impress one thing, right? I, I believe the reason why we're not seeing kind of a, a, an outpouring a revival is another reason is because people are after a revival, right? Now, we should not, as believers we should and leaders, we should not be after a revival, but we need to be after God, right? So remember, we our quest, we study that to be more like Jesus. So even in church history, William Carey, you use the example of William Carey. William Carey pursued after God. He His, his mind was not set on a revival, uh, probably didn't know what revival was, or uh, he his mind was not set on an outpouring or uh, miracles and all of that. His mind was set on Jesus, right? I need to be more like Jesus. I want Jesus to be uh, you know, manifested in my life. And you know, the, the focus was Jesus more than revivals, miracles, and all of that. But now what is happening is the, we've kept Jesus aside and we're saying, okay, we want the miracles, we want the prophecies, we want the word of knowledge, uh, we want all these wonderful things that is attached to the Holy Spirit, but pursuing of Jesus has gone down. So it should be the other way around, right? The more we pursue Jesus, the more we are after him, the more we, uh, you know, focus on him rather than, uh, you know, the outpouring and all of it, that will automatically bring in the outpouring or a revival of God. So I believe that we should uh, remember this, you know, uh, that it should be more of Jesus. Uh, and right now, when you look at ministries, all ministries, we all pray for revival. That's good. Uh, but the focus is not, okay, uh, or, you know, uh, I want to see hundreds, thousands of people coming and then, um, you know, uh, miracles and a wonderful, so, you know, stage with thousands of people. That's not the focus. The focus is to be more like Jesus. And out of that flows the other things, right? Uh, automatically, right? If we are uh, focused more and we're on Jesus and uh, spending more time in the word of God and all of that, automatically you will have a revival or an outpouring. But I believe that the modern church has, we have reversed it, right? Uh, because it's good to hear, uh, you know, healings and uh, prophecies. It, it sounds nice, right? Uh, uh, but then the pursuing of God has become lesser, right? So it should be the other way around. And uh, I just thought I'd leave you with that. Uh, that, that beautifully yeah. summarizes. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That's a beautiful summary. Thank you. Thank, yeah. you, Thank you, Sam. Yeah, Rupa, you can go ahead. Uh, just, we have two yeah, minutes left. Thank you, so. thank you, sir. Just I wanted to add a point. That, sir. As I said, it's more about pursuing Jesus. And I also say, in revival, you see God glorified. And people don't see Rupa, or they don't see Samuel or Paul ministering. But they would see Jesus walking on this earth. And he will be magnified and glorified in our midst in a true revival. So we are seeking revival that we would bring Jesus glorified and magnified into our midst that people may turn to him and be saved. That's what I just wanted to add it. Yeah, thank you, Rupa, that's true. All right, so we've come past our time, uh, but here's what I want to do. I want to encourage each one of you. Uh, What we'll be doing tomorrow is we will be looking at the book of Acts right? Uh, We will divide it into three sections. Uh, But from today, I would encourage you to start reading on the life of Apostle Paul, because what we will do is uh, Paul was a carrier of revival. So we will learn uh, how he, you know, uh, spread this outpouring, right? Uh, We see that he started off uh, from Jerusalem, his first missionary journey, he went on 
on uh, uh, you know uh, four missionary journeys doing a wonderful work of god so um i encourage you just uh, try to find time and begin to read uh, from acts 13 to acts 28 is uh, talks about uh, paul's life acts 13 to acts 28 so just maybe you can start reading one chapter a day uh, and, and so it will help us even in our study. So, you know, uh, we will be uh, on the same page. So, uh, so we'll stop now. Uh, we'll pick up from next week, uh, sorry, tomorrow. Uh, we will pick up from the book of Acts. We'll see what revival, uh, what, how the revival was there and, uh, and what we can learn from all of this from the book of Acts. So, all right, let's just pray and we will close. Father, we want to thank you for this class, Lord. We thank you for your move among us, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit uh, that is still working in our midst to God. And Lord, we pray, God, even as we study about revivals and uh, look at church history, study from your word, God, I pray that you will continue to revive our hearts, revive our spirits, Lord, that there will be a greater hunger a greater desire to know more of you oh god we thank you god for all these things that have been made available for us to study oh god i pray lord that you bless each of us bless the students as they begin this new week of study of, of this uh course oh god i pray that you will be with them fill us all with your spirit of wisdom and understanding oh god we give you all the praise and glory in jesus name we pray amen Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. God Thank bless. You.